This is the Back Porch Education Podcast. Join us today uh, when Steve and I try to think through prior times in history when education was interrupted. Get your education. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon. Steve, I'm a, a little bit nervous about this episode today because I'm not sure where it's leading. I don't have a strong thesis to, uh, you know, pin at the end and, and I don't have a, a bow to tie on it. Um, but I do think that it's an important conversation. Well, I don't even know that I think it's important it seems like it might be a good idea, a worthwhile idea, to consider the decisions that previous teachers, uh, previous parents have faced uh, when, for one reason or another, a uh, natural disaster or what have you, um, education is seriously uh, knocked off the rails. What do you think? Well, I'm looking forward to a conversation um, coming at it from the perspective of uh, I'm regularly, and I know our listeners will be shocked by this fact, but okay. I'm, I'm, I'm regularly accused of being philosophical but not practical. Uh-huh. And I believe... That old lie. <laughs> that, old, that old moniker. Yes. That gets, uh, um, I, I'm, I'm a firm believer that, that having yourself philosophically... Uh, a tune mm-hmm. uh, leads to a, a good performance or, or practical things. And and I think if we're going to kind of imagine our way back through history and what would teachers have done w- when you can't do it the normal way, yeah. uh, my, my opinion is that, that one's definition of what education is is going to determine the success with which you pivot or find yourself uh, sort of wandering in the dark because you're not really sure why you were doing what you were doing to begin Ooh, with. Nice. Okay. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to this. Um, I'm going to go ahead and, and admit to the listeners that we, we kind of grabbed a, uh, a timeline of past pandemics right. and, and don't intend to bore you with historical facts and figures, uh, no. uh, how many died and all that kind of stuff, but more just use it as a basis to to, to do a, a sort of a thought experiment here yeah. of given where we are in 2021 uh, and what we've gone through over the last year with the, the COVID situation, yep. what, it's not the first time it's happened in history. Right. What can we learn? Yeah. Right. Is that... Exactly. Yeah, that, that's that's just it. Um, so that that's very good. Um, what can we learn? Uh, and not learn, like you said, uh, based on some information. Uh, but what can reflecting on uh, prior times with the knowledge that we have? What can that do for us? Uh, what can uh, what can we learn sort of out of our own heads, as it were, right? Yep. Um, so, what do you say to an old poem? <laughs> Nothing at all. <laughs> <laughs> well, well okay. how old is it? Yeah, Just... good question. I was going to ask you uh, when I say old poem, how what do you, what do you think? Early Frost? <laughs> no. Beatles. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Nice. Yeah. No, I'm thinking Parmenides. Okay, Pindar, something like that. Yeah, nice, okay. nice. Um, so Parmenides uh, was one of the pre-Socratics. And um, for those of you who maybe aren't familiar with the pre-Socratics, it's fine. Uh, it just means real, real old, right? Um, Before Socrates. Socrates. Exactly. Not exactly. to be condescending. No, no, of course not. Um so, uh, he wrote a uh, poem that some say is the foundation of uh, Western, uh, the Western mind. Uh, wow, I which, didn't know he had that. Yeah, yeah. Hung around his neck. Yeah, yeah. Right. Okay. <laughs> On nature. 
Um, oh, okay. All right. Yeah, and so it's divided into three parts, an intro, the way of truth, and the way of opinion. Um, but I'm just going to, it's very long, and I'm, I'm only going to read about half of the introduction, um, uh, although it's, it's, uh, it's excellent. Um, so it's, it's worth a read. Um, but here we go. Uh, l- listen to this part. Uh, Welcome, O youth, that comest to my abode on the car, that is carriage, right? On the car that bears thee, tended by immortal charioteers. It is no ill chance, but right and justice that has sent thee forth to travel on this way. Far indeed does it lie from the beaten track of men. Meet it is that thou shouldst learn all things, as well the unshaken heart of well-rounded truth, as the opinions of mortals, in which is no true belief at all. Yet nonetheless shalt thou learn these things also, how passing right through all things one should judge the things that seem to be. But do thou restrain thy thought from this way of inquiry, nor let habit by its much experience force thee to cast upon this way a wandering eye, or sounding ear or tongue. But judge by argument the much disputed proof uttered by me. There is only one way left that can be spoken of. And from there he goes on to discuss the way of truth. Um, so he sets up a dialectic here, um, two paths, two roads diverge in the yellow wood. Um, we have, so uh, Frost is a thief. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> Plagiarist. That's right. As I have so, my suspicions. <laughs> unshaken heart of well-rounded truth. That's one way. Yeah. And the other is the opinions of mortals in which there is no true belief at all. Hmm. But he says they're both, uh, Parmenides says, they're both worth learning. Uh, because if you know the, the prior, the, for, the better, then you can easily judge the things that seem to be. Hmm. Um, why did I choose this one in particular? Well, I guess because... Um, it's a little bit mysterious. Uh, it's very old, but it's uh, grounding in a way that I think is important uh, to when, when we're thinking about a topic like this. So, um, well, you want to start uh, in Athens, if that's where we're... Uh, yeah, I'd I can... follow up on your poem by saying that, that it's a, sort of a, a way of saying that the more things change, the more they stay the same, hmm. yep. right? And that, that we're f- there, we're building off this notion that there are some things, regardless of time and place, that as they pertain to human education are so, right? Yes. That you, you might look, for instance, uh, they were starting uh, 430 B.C. in Athens with the first recorded pandemic, mm-hmm. right? Uh, which had a, a pretty fundamental effect on the Athenians. You. It, it's it's they're they're in the Peloponnesian Wars. They're against the Spartans. Are have their city sieged, mm-hmm. and this disease, uh, many think it's probably typhoid, comes up through northern Africa into Europe, and actually manages to get inside the walls. <laughs> Not going to make too much about social distancing. <laughs> sure, <master>. sure. <laughs> but but manages to uh, take out quite a number of Athenians and weaken the rest. Yeah, probably if not single-handedly, at least a major factor in the Athenian defeat mm-hmm. by the Spartans, mm-hmm. uh, who were much less affected by the by the pandemic. But but we're not looking at it from the standpoint of the uh, who won or lost the Peloponnesian Wars, but here's Athens, the, the, the sort of birthplace of Western education. Right. At at really one of its high points, or, well, yeah. its low point, and it's losing to Sparta. Sure. But, but right at the point of founding our civilization yeah and it has a gap in its educational process right not nearly as affected because of the differences right mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. that for the most part education was was not for everybody it was right. it was for some right and it was mostly a product of the home whether that was bringing tutors into the home mm-hmm. or the parents themselves right teaching the kids. Yeah. Um, 
in essence, what we've wound up doing recently <laughs> sure. is stay at home learning. Yep. Uh, was the was the mark of the Athenian? I mean, certainly you're going to have uh, Plato and Aristotle and others found academies right. where young men would come to study. Yeah. But uh, the bulk. This this is back when homeschooling was the majority. Yeah. And what we call schooling. Uh, groups yeah. in another uh, co ops, as it were, <laughs> uh, were, 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 the, were the unusual. Yeah. Um, so we've, by flopping that, we, um, we found that uh, bringing a bunch of kids together for schooling poses mm-hmm. certain difficulties when, when the sickness comes. Right. Or, or, or other. Yeah. Uh, I don't know that we're just talking about. Pandemics and, and sure. illnesses, uh, uh, great. I, th- I think the London Fire and some other things come up that highly affect. Sure. For a while. Sure. How the norm? Yeah. Well, yeah. The the London is an interesting um, case that we can certainly bring our uh, knowledge of the education of Shakespeare to bear on that uh, conversation. But I I want to um, camp out in Athens for a minute. I. Uh, I remember reading in Maru um, that is... Not to drop any names or anything Not to drop any names. A History of Education in Antiquity. Um, Which is an opportunity for me to pitch the uh, side porch product. Oh, absolutely. My survey of ancient, medieval, and modern education, uh, which the ancient part was almost... Probably eighty percent of it came yeah. out of Maru's work. Yeah, I would say uh, don't. Well, I mean, it it would be uh, a bad. Uh, it would be bad form for me to uh, encourage someone not to read uh, the book. But um, I would say that uh, provision. It's yourself. a lot <laughs> yeah. to dive into uh, unequipped, right? And so if you can, the, uh, sort of getting a lay of the land before you uh, plunge into uh, all of the idiosyncrasies of antiquity, um, I mean, Mar- this thing is a weighty book. So um, anyway, uh, I remember him saying in here that around the time of the Peloponne- Peloponnesian War um, is when, I'm not going to be able to find it now, but um, education shifted um, in in Athens, <clears throat> from being uh, one, from being mil, uh, mil- a military education to uh, a civil education, yeah. Yeah. right? Um, Still fitting that notion of wisdom and virtue. Oh, absolutely. I would say that one starts to. It almost flipped. I think. I think virtue, mm-hmm. in particular, the courage of the warrior. Yeah, when you're reading Homer or whatnot, is, is the thing the arete, right? Yes, the, the, yes. The, the, the live forever because you were brave enough to win the war, so mm-hmm. to speak. Um, and and now they see that, especially as they move in the democratic direction, right? That a good citizen, a wise, yeah, certainly still virtuous, but now wise, right? And their <clears throat> and their education, I. I I think one of the reasons they could survive and thrive even after two-thirds of their population gets decimated by a pandemic mm-hmm. is because it was simple. Uh, the, the there, there was not a... a the society whole, was simple? No, the education itself. Uh-huh. I mean, I've gotten myself into some wonderful arguments, but I still think it's true, that you can boil the curriculum of our founding educational system down to two subjects, poetry and PE. Uh huh, and yeah, and, and Maru doesn't find much more than that. Now, by right. poetry, we don't just mean what we do at the start of every podcast. Right, it's the whole how that fits in with with music, well, sure, composition. Right, but 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 the poetic, yeah, the knowledge of the word, right, as defines me, mm-hmm. not as something out there that I take tests on. Exactly, but that becomes me. Right. And the body, the mind and body are brought together through poetry and physical discipline, yep. right? By, by physical education. Skill. PD. 
Yeah. They they mean the Olympic Games and they mean the wrestling right. and they mean all the stuff that Paul's talking about. I I condition my body daily that I'm that I might run the race well. Yes. Right. Uh, and he even ties it into the spiritual life of of so I my, my eternal soul has yeah. to surely keep up with the body. Right. Right. Um, and uh, and I think that that puts a um, when, when I talk to homeschoolers today, right? One of the one of the concerns is I got to teach all these different subjects, hmm. and I try to find a way to to without saying no, you don't. Yeah. Say yes, but I don't think it's as complex as you're making it. Yeah, I love the notion that you've introduced of uh, simplicity and complexity, um, which. <clears throat> I uh, introduce as often as I can <laughs> um, because I think it's a super helpful uh, discrimination to make. Um, and I always, anytime uh, I start using the words simple and complex, I always hasten to add that those are not correlated with easy and difficult. Right. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That something can be very simple. And extremely mm-hmm. difficult. Maybe because of it. So <laughs> exactly. Jump over that bar. Yeah. Right. That the, there's no ambiguity. Right. There's no. Um, there. There's no two ways about it. Uh, but the high jump is enormously difficult. Right. Right. Um, so uh, I, I I think that's right. Um, and perhaps that's one of the things that as a um, as a teacher in Athens, uh, perhaps that would be a, a guiding principle um, that that we would be thinking about uh, if we were in that situation. Of um, well, it's it's the cultivation it's the cultivation of wisdom and virtue. Right. So whatever that means for these kids right now, that's what we're doing. Right, right, and and um, not. Well, I think this will come up in other places, but 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 one of the thoughts I had in my head as I as I thought about this was, um, it, part of what we do to ourselves is is come up with a notion of what school ought to be, and then just about kill ourselves trying to flesh that out, even when the circumstances change. Mm, yeah, you know what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. And so when something unexpected comes along that makes us have to pivot. We struggle more with, I would say, the appearances. Oh, we still got to give tests. Yeah. Or we got to maintain. We can't let any of the subjects drop. Right. Uh, I've I've fought this with school scheduling. Okay. Because I have introduced the concept from time to time, and it makes it much more complex. Mm-hmm. And yet, to me, it would simplify the problems of education. So if I, I'm not going to even get into the block scheduling that. Okay. That efficiency experts have introduced into public schooling. But, sure. And, and I know some private schools that do that as well. But for those of us that are still kind of maintaining, we have a number of different subjects we want to teach, and each subject is going to get taught every day, I've, I've questioned why. Mm-hmm. Aren't there some subjects that you need every day because of their Because of the way that the mind, nature, yeah, the impression is taken. The, the dominoes right? need to keep falling right. daily, right? And I would put something like, mathematics or a language acquisition or something sure. like that and those but that some of the other subjects we get into this equity notion yes that it's about time when some things are caught taught yep led into with more easily mm-hmm. than other subjects and therefore don't need as much don't need the same amount of time right in fact, some of the subjects suffer from not having enough time. Right. And the teachers are always like fighting bell to bell. Yep. And if they were given some sort of a schedule that allowed them a little more time because some other subjects that don't need it. Yep. And I'm not going to get into the war of what subjects do and don't so sure. much as the fact that I don't. In, in, in this conversation, I think it's enough to just simply say that we sometimes build barriers for ourselves in our mind that are not necessary. Yeah for real education to occur. Right. The the structure the tail is wagging the dog. Yes. Right? Yes. Like like the structure is um I don't know. Yeah, it, it's we see this sort of thing all the time, right? When um when we have uh, a group of people who um 
kind of forget what they're doing and are just constantly talking about how they're doing Mm -hmm. that thing. And there are conversations to be had about how we're doing uh, education. We should have those conversations. We should continue uh, to do that. Uh, But in the end, um, again, let let us not be uh, accused of being uh, philosophical instead of practical. What we're saying is how, how we get there depends on where there is. Yeah. So bringing up where there is is n- eminently practical. Right, right, right. Yep. Well, um, I wanted to mention the Justinian plague because it's an interesting... Yeah, dude, I don't know thing. much about, like, basically anything about this, so lay it on well, me. Well, <laughs> the, the emperor okay. Justinian... Okay. Right. Yeah. Is, is made emperor of Rome right. at a time when Rome is busting up. We're talking 541 AD. Oh, boy. All right. Okay. So the, the empire is crumbling. Right. In part because of some bad choices they've made in education. <laughs> <laughs> that virtue thing wasn't going real well for them. <laughs> <laughs> but um, uh, so Justinian has these great plans. He's a great general. Uh, he looks like he's going to successfully be bringing... Um, the empire back together. Okay. Uh, he maybe is a little foolish financially, but currency debasement, all this is that inflation? Just, uh, I think and spending. All that's, oh yeah, yeah, spending. spending. Okay. Trying to recover the glory of Rome, right. Through the pocketbook, right. How about another Colosseum? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, and right in the middle of it, right smack dab in the middle of it, is a plague. Huh. Um. Most of the Mediterranean world was affected by it. Um, it it affected things not... And this is why I wanted to bring it out. It wasn't just the fact that people were dying. It's the mental, spiritual effect that it had on people. Okay. Um, Christians, for instance, who at that point are very important to the Roman Empire. Yes. Right? This is after Constantine. Right. Um, view this apocalyptically. Mm-hmm. This is the end of the world. This is what Jesus was talking about. And uh, it wasn't. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Apparently, that was wrong. Right. Um, but um, uh, they had to deal with this for almost 20 years. Mm. I mean, this is way before we understood what a plague, what yeah, germ theory. bacteria. Yeah, germ right. theory. It's, it's completely foreign. Right. In fact... Notably, part of what made it last longer is people fleeing Rome. Yeah, everybody's dying. Let's get out in the country and taking it with them. Yeah, sure, <laughs> and sure. Spreading it. Spreading it. You're right. So um, uh, they estimate fifty million. Oh man, a twenty-six percent of the world population at this point. Wow. One in four. Wow. That has to have rocked. Now, now there's a lot more there too. So, so again, context. Education is struggling in the Justinian Roman world, mm-hmm. right? The old ways have been thrown aside, and there's right. been a lot of what we were just talking about going through the motions. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot more Dang. stuff of a practical nature, yeah, and um, um, school for schooling's sake. Mm-hmm. So. When you've got this level of illness raging through your circumstances, right? Yeah. Um, I don't know enough about it to know if it completely ceased. Right. But they certain Many will point to the Justinian plague as a major player in the eventual fall of Rome. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I would say probably as much for how it disrupted the passing on of the culture. Exactly, tradition, right? Yeah. As, the hand-to-hand. As just death toll. I mean, th- one in four is a big death. That's, right. That's going to affect things. But, right. But of those surviving, there's just like this great blank. Yeah. You know, we were starting to talk about gaps. Yeah. Here's a gap. Well, right. and, and when it's a 20-year yes. situation, I mean, this is not... Um, this is not that of... everybody missed fourth grade. Right, no, this it, is... Like, this is, uh, yeah, I mean, kids 
who uh, would, because at, at this point still uh, nobility is, uh, is the major uh, purchaser. Right, of education. And so... Um, From about 5 to 14, 15. Yeah, right. In age. Right, right. right. Um, little shorter than ours. Yeah. But still, that's start to finish two cycles. Exactly. Right. And so you have, you have men and women who, whose parents were no doubt educated. Right. They're now having children and uh they like are their kids gonna go to school or not right mm-hmm. like but they really didn't uh they did like they Can didn't we find receive, a tutor or right not? yeah exactly are exactly. we even going to be able to make this work right <clears throat> or should we just forget about it yeah which is interesting because it's not long after groups that were never been educated, the quote-unquote barbarians, Mm -hmm. are are running room. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, Mm. it's 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 an interesting drop-off. Yeah, no doubt. So So as a... If you're a parent in Rome, or shortly thereafter, a parent outside of Rome, right? Mm -hmm. You retire to the countryside. Um... And now all of a sudden, uh, you are um, away from uh, community. You're away from the tutors uh, whom you knew, unless you brought them with you. What, uh, I don't know. I'm I'm struck by uh, one of the things that I I keep uh, thinking about with these older plagues. Mm Mm-hmm is that uh, it's also something that I'm thinking about. It's probably because I'm reading so much Little House on the Prairie with my (laughs) my daughters, right? But uh, what I'm always struck by uh, there is that when... um, that it's understandable that uh, Laura and Almanzo will sometimes keep um, Rose home from school. And, And that... It's not because of uh, some outbreak, right? It's just because there is employment for the child in the home. Right, needed. Yeah, yeah. That, like that. So, so, so school. She's going to school, um, and you know, in these uh, various ancient times, people are going to schools, um, but uh, that is always seen as an opportunity. Uh, it's never. Um, it's never expected or, uh, it's never the sort of thing that becomes, uh, a given to the point that we don't know how to employ the child at home. Right. Or, or how to bring them to adulthood apart from this act of schooling. Right. The vast majority of any society right up probably till industrialization hits Europe, mm-hmm. the, the majority were unschooled. Right. There was a few, the typically the ruling few, right. that, that had gained the wisdom and virtue to rise to the top. Right. And, and you know, you, the term here properly used is privilege. Yeah. Um, it's that's a loaded word these days. Sure, sure. But 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 they were allowed something not everyone had a chance at. Right. It strikes me as you're talking that that, that we have to. Come, this is pre book. So you know, five forty one. We, we're talking scrolls at best, but most of it oral, which is an interesting thought because there's a sense in which that's so much more mobile. Yeah. It's t- more tenuous. Right. But if you have access to somebody else who has the knowledge, it's transferred orally much quicker. I don't think as well mm-hmm. as we've enjoyed since the advent of books. But but I do think that there's a there's a factor there that anything we're looking at pandemic wise prior to books, yeah. Education is of its nature a different animal. It right. is it is much more of a of a discussion, a mm-hmm. conversation, mm-hmm. 
than uh, assigned readings with right. discussion afterwards. Well, the world was so s much more separate then, right? Like, yes. the, yeah. the book... Um, okay, fine. The internet brought the world uh, together uh, in a way that hadn't been done before, to, the, to an extent that hadn't been done before. Uh, but it had been done before, and it was the book, yeah. right? Well, now, now I'm thinking about um, the story you've told before about Wendell Berry saying that education needs to get real local, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Uh, that it seems to me that education was quite local. Uh, and so when you... Um, I'm trying to tie that into the notion, like the orality of, of it uh, that you were mentioning earlier... You know, you, you live in a town or you live in the countryside uh, and you're taught there and you live there. Right. And uh, what's going on in other parts of the world, yeah, scrolls were um, really nice, but it, they wouldn't be, it wasn't newspaper kind of stuff, right? Right. It was this is stores wisdom. of wisdom. Yeah. 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 So. Most of which was poetry and prose. Yeah literature that could be communicated at least generally mm -hmm. by a father to his son. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you the story of Beowulf. Right. Type deal. Right. Um, which is a good one to bring up because it was oral for quite yeah. some time. Um, to, to, to not get bogged down, um, yeah. I wanted to mention the Black Death, 1350. Okay. Um, Chaucer writes his... Uh his Canterbury Tales in uh, the middle of this. In, in the, the middle of it, right? The, yeah. That's this an aspect of, of any number of uh, past downer moments in history that, right. that great literature comes out. <laughs> it does. It does. It's a very, I, I can't remember where, but somewhere uh, I heard a teacher say, I think it was Donald Kagan uh, on, from the Yale courses. Um, he said, uh, maybe it wasn't, that a very Greek notion is, uh, or the, the way that the Greeks dealt with the world was when they acknowledged, they saw the misery of life and they sat down and painted it as it was. Mm. Like that, that was their response to it, right? Not mm. to um, run or escape, but to acknowledge. Mm. Mm. And um, I, th I think that uh, Chaucer is... Uh, doing that in a certain sense when he is um, making good literature, right? He's making something uh, to be enjoyed. And, and, and these are stakes down in the mud of history, mm -hmm. right? These are, these are moments of pivot. Uh, 1350, a third of the world dies. God. A third of the world's population at that time of war is England and France bring their war to a halt, right? Because they're losing people; they're losing more people from sickness than from the battle. Mm -hmm. uh, and in particular, what I would point out, and I, I talk to my students about this on a regular basis because I teach medieval literature. This is where the feudal system crumbles. Yes, because of oh, dude, good point. I hadn't thought illness of illness just changes so. So um, when we come to a circumstance where things are just radically brought to a halt, they often don't start back up the same way. There isn't, you know, you keep hearing this new norm mm -hmm. thing mm -hmm. um, in a world that's struggling to have norms. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, but, but certainly the medieval world didn't have a problem with norms. Right. It's just that when they got going again, it was in a whole different direction. The infrastructure could not, uh, be supported by that amount of people, right? Right. It took more hands yep. than they had. Yeah. And yeah, dude, there was, um, oh man, that's interesting. I'm also thinking, because there was like a series of um, peasant revolts at that time too, mm -hmm. yep. right? Where you have um, uh, farmers saying, forget this, start paying us better. Like we're not going to... Um, we're not going to continue to work uh, for these wages uh, because you're living off of us. Right, yeah. When, right? when the pandemic comes, 
We suffer way more than you do. Right. 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 Some of you haven't lost a meal. Yeah. The rest of us haven't had a meal in yes, a while. Exactly. Right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, which which carries this on down 1665. Fascinating to me back on, on what you said about Chaucer. So you have two pretty significant English writers, yeah. one of which writes survivalist literature, having survived the Great Plague of London, 1665, which included in its occurrence the Great Fire of London, yes. where 90% of the structures in London burned to the ground. Ooh. And the plague itself, right, Yeah. Um, I, I, I pulled up a mortality chart, and it just shoots off the roof. Uh. I mean, it's amazing. Uh, between 1665 and 1666, uh, the, the bubonic plague takes mm -hmm. out 20% of the population. Mm. And it's, it's, it's so on top of illness, you have deprivation, right, of, of a fire. That, and here, uh, uh, Daniel Defoe survives yeah. both of these and writes Robinson Crusoe. The first novel right? I was uh, taught in my graduate studies. Right. Many view this as the first novel. And, and, and writes this brilliant piece about a man yeah. surviving cataclysmic yeah misfortune right right um uh, mm. being marooned on an island ostensibly yeah. by himself until the great footprint uh, appears mm -hmm. um and seven years later in response to robinson crusoe is jonathan swift's gulliver's travels right swift as well surviving these two great instances one of illness and one of fire mm -hmm. um and it, it's, it, it is interesting when you compare, these are the last two works we read in my, my sophomore uh, English class, uh, you have the, the, the optimism of Robinson Crusoe that you, in fact, can flourish. Yeah. Um, and then uh, Gulliver aimlessly getting marooned in various right. places that are much worse than right. places he's been before. Um, yeah. Um, and, I, and, I, and in at least the critical literature I read, um, uh, Gulliver is, is seen as a, res a purposeful response huh. to Crusoe. Um, I, I didn't make it. There. it the, the class on the beginning of the novel that I took was uh, a summer class. Hmm. And uh, this that book was one of the last ones, right? Swift. And I was burned out. <laughs> so I loved Robinson Crusoe. Uh, but man, I'm not, as, I'm not half as familiar with Swift because I got tired. Yeah. It was a summer. My students could relate. Oh <laughs> <Right. laughs> uh, yeah, but but okay. So then, but education the book at is that there. time. Yeah, exactly. And in in the seventeenth century, you have much more of a sort of typical school books, right? Desk teacher orientation lecture, right? right. Subjects grades, uh, but still for the privileged. Yeah. Still for just a few. Right. Uh, more mm -hmm. than before. The, the, the falling down of the feudal system has meant more seek education. Right. Because there's more opportunity through it. Right. Um, but it's still pre-industrialization mm -hmm. and pre-compulsory education. Yes, exactly. I don't know if we want to get in too harshly into uh, Horace Mann and his right. uh, abolishing prisons by proliferating schools, mm -hmm. but, um, but, but it does change things. Radically, yeah. When, as as I think you were pointing out earlier, if you can get an education, it's really helpful to you. This pandemic's making it harder, but you can still survive. Mm -hmm. Versus, every child, I'm just going to use America here. Yeah. Must go to school between the ages of five and sixteen. Must right. be accounted for. In fact, in part, we build a whole, uh, in many ways, a whole system. Mm -hmm. uh, that allows for mom and dad to work right. because there's a place for children to be. Right. Um, we've built a workplace that expects a certain level of education or you're not even considered for employment. Right. Right. So my grandfather, with a sixth grade education, would have been out of luck mm -hmm. had he been born a generation later. Right. Both of his daughters headed off and completed college. Mm -hmm. um, which were the first two people on any either side of their family to ever consider it. Not just women, but anyone. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and so, 
that that changes things. You know, yeah. as as, it, as interesting as it is to go back and look, we have to recognize that that uh, context is a lot. That, that you you had mentioned uh, before we start recording that the nineteen eighteen Spanish flu is really mm-hmm. ve- probably what I find myself going back to the most and trying to get some sense. Right, and it's a hundred years ago. Right, so still medically speaking distant from us sure. as to what we can and can't do but I think the effect is similar and of course the, the death toll was monumentally yeah. larger uh, uh, a lot larger than, than what we're currently yeah. you know, 50 million deaths mm. 50 million deaths from the Spanish flu more if I'm not mistaken more than, than were killed in the war just ending mm-hmm. war one mm-hmm. not as violent but but I yeah, I've had the flu. Lost I haven't life. had the Spanish flu, but I have. I've had the flu. I don't want to. Right. I don't want to die from that. No, that's <laughs> not a, that's not a happy thing. I uh, I'm, I'm I'm cogitating on how the book um, sort of allows the uh, I don't know all the details of Abraham Lincoln's uh, life and education. Okay, but we know kind of the folklore of it, right? Um, stays up late at night, has a few books, um, and studies them, uh, and is able to educate himself well enough to continue on, right? Um, with little Cast outside help. Right. Yep. Right. So, um, I'm struck by how we have that, uh, that the book enables, there, there's this window where the book enables, um, a man or a boy like Abraham Lincoln uh, to um, progress the way he did. Uh, and then it's only, uh, I would point to Frederick Douglass too, uh, that he's, mm-hmm. he's in yep. much the same category. Um, 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 Booker T. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, Sorry, Booker T. Washington. Right, 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 right. Um, uh, Douglass uh, steals a book of Cicero's speeches, right? Mm-hmm. And, uh, but he... One of uh, his quotes that I absolutely love is, "All that I know, I have stolen." Right? That he that he sort of he gets it from places. He yep. finds it. Um, it's amazing. Um, I wish uh, I was uh, as mm, hungry for uh, hungry for it as he was. Yeah. Well, uh, in, in that time, I don't know if it was Twain. Somebody voiced the opinion. You know, what if we could throw over the whole formal schooling for a good public library? <laughs> right? Sounds like twenty. <laughs> and and if I'm not mistaken, it was a comment like that that launched uh, the the wealthy Dale Carnegie to oh yeah to found these libraries. Andrew across. Carnegie. Andrew, sorry. Yeah, Dale, Dale is was uh, the other dude. Yeah. <laughs> Andrew to to found these. Uh, um, Islands of Mercy. Yeah, I mean, no I mean, doubt. My, well my little said. town in the middle of Kansas had a Carnegie Library. No kidding. And I, I, I grew up in that thing. Wow. And still judge other libraries somewhat harshly mm-hmm. because it was well funded and had had a wonderful. Well, it's just a wonderful library. So it was built to to be learned in. Yeah. And um, um, but but here's the, here's why I brought up in industrialization earlier. Yeah. Is there's a turn exactly in education exactly so th- so that's what I'm so the book enables this to happen but then relatively soon thereafter we get um, another structural change in society right another a, a radically different practice of push them all into a place and that's the we're going to say that's where learning takes place. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we really, school started to perform a different function mm-hmm. than it had. Yep. Uh, and I don't know. I, I think like you say that, um, when like you, like your uh, comments on feudalism, when, uh, things, uh, break down, um, they're often not put together the same way. And I, and I wonder how things are going to look there. Uh, I wonder how uh, analogous the internet now is to the book for Abraham Lincoln. 
and mm-hmm. Frederick Douglass. Mm-hmm. Uh, if if it won't um, sufficiently allow people to return to the home and thereby um, allow them to have their children at home uh, and have them learning. Yep. You know? Well, and, and I hear educators excited about the future. Sure. And what this COVID break mm-hmm. uh, speaks, I have I, I hear concern as well. And, and that's the that's the beauty of, of considering the future is you can have both hope and sure fear um but uh but but we're at one of those places and so so i don't think despite the differences and Mm -hmm. i think we've admitted those yep i still think there's a great deal of usefulness in running it back through Mm -hmm. if nothing else history teaches us that we can move forward right that it isn't as they thought you know, <laughs> just in time, the, yeah. uh, the end of the world. It right. might be the end of the world as we know it. Sure. But we can still feel fine if we want to. <laughs> 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 and REM works its way into it. Yes. Do we have to pay for that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, like I said, uh, I don't have a bow uh, to tie on this uh, conversation. Um, but um, the practice of thinking through this uh, is, I think, worthwhile. There are, I'm leaving this uh, conversation with some thoughts that I would like to mull over. And uh, and I hope you are, and I I hope our listeners are. Yeah, I have fun.